Um, but just to kind of give you a little bit of a, a background around uh, Griffin X, it's uh, you know kind of what it is and, and, and what it isn't. And uh, uh, it's always nice, you know, I'm, I'm right now I'm on the, uh, on the West Coast uh, at Ames Research Center, sits right in the center of uh, Silicon Valley, so there's a, a, a lot of opportunity there uh, to deal with innovators and, and meet different folks and, and really do a lot of strategies and um, really come up with some really, really uh, good ideas. So Griffin X, um, is, at, is currently, it's just, it's a proposal is what it is inside of NASA. And uh, for lack of a better term, I'm kind of the architect of the, of the proposal uh, that came up with the, with the idea uh, around Griffin X and what it is. And uh, people have asked me over and over again, you know, what exactly, uh, where'd you come up with the name Griffin X? And like I always say, I say before anything else, you gotta have a cool name, right? So I, so I remember as I was kind of thinking about this idea, which the, the good idea fairy came to me one night and said, hey, I have an idea for you. And I got up and I said, you know, I, first I just do anything. I got to have a, a really cool name. So I started thinking about different animals and that sort of thing. And I thought about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what are the different nocturnal animals that are out there? And I'm like, okay, well, skunk works. That's already taken. Uh, I'm think about barracuda. They're going to confuse with barracuda networks or something like that. And I actually was driving somewhere, and I saw a picture of the, you know, the old mythical animal beast, uh, the griffin. And I thought it was a perfect uh, kind of a, uh, a name to use. And I, and I thought to myself what it could represent, you know, the eagle head with the United States, the wings and that sort of thing, uh, which is steeped in tradition around NASA of flight and stuff like that. The, the, the talons in the front legs and the lion's uh, uh, legs in the back kind of are different capabilities and things like that that we do. And then the X I threw in for experimental or, you know, like an algebraic expression, solve for X. We don't know what we're trying to solve, but we're going to solve it at some point, we believe. So I, so I came up with this uh, kind of the name and, and started to socialize it. But where it really came from is that at Ames Research Center, we do... Uh, quite a bit of work uh, around particularly uh, aeronautics is, is one area that we work quite a bit, where there's manufacturers, uh, carriers, and things of, of that nature. We do work uh, in our wind tunnels and things like that. Uh, at the same time, I was thinking about, I was thinking through all the issues that uh, was out there in the world today around uh, uh, E-enabled aircraft and connected aircraft and things like that. And we also work uh, with FAA on, on next-gen air traffic management as well at, at Ames Research Center. So I started thinking, you know, if we're doing so much work with uh, the carriers and that sort of thing, manufacturers, um, from, let's say, wind tunnel testing or artificial intelligence perspective, I said, why would we not look at the cyber issues that are resident uh, in those, in those uh, aircraft as, as well, or in those networks that are inside the aircraft. And I thought about that because at Ames in particular, where I work, um, we're kind of, the, uh, kind of the center of gravity for security operations for NASA. So we run the NASA Security Operations Center out there, the Global Security Operations Center, and do a lot of the security operations, the projects, security projects for NASA as a whole out of Ames Research Center. So I thought it would be a great uh, opportunity to work with manufacturers, that sort of thing, and, and started weeding out some of the issues around uh, E-enabled um, uh, aircraft. And then at the same time, I started thinking about the other work that we did at, at NASA with uh, different partners. So we, were, we have an agreement with, uh, we call them Space Act agreements. Uh, we have one with uh, Nissan, and we also have one with Google on autonomous vehicles. And we are, uh, Ames Research Center has a long history in autonomy, uh, whether it be unmanned aerial systems, um, and robotics. And so, uh, again, I thought to myself, well, if we're going to work with uh, these manufacturers um, on autonomous vehicles, on the, on the AI side of it, on the artificial intelligence side, I said, why would we not work the cyber issues that are there as well? And I started to think to myself that, you know, I think there's an opportunity here to have a platform where we can work all these different issues. At the same time, I was looking at how do we weed out some of the vulnerabilities and issues in NASA's current infrastructure, but more importantly, the emerging infrastructure, infrastructure that we're going to need 
to uh, you know, guide, command, and control, uh, whether they be space-borne uh, assets or whether they be aerial assets, as we're trying to get to, to the moon, back to the moon, to Mars, and, and beyond, what is that infrastructure going to look at? And what are the vulnerabilities going to be present in that infrastructure? And how do we test that infrastructure for vulnerabilities and weed those out and weed it and build in good security practices and engineering before that technology is filled in? And so part of that was a thinking about end-to-end -end security and engineering from end-to-end. -end. So I, what, I, what I call from tooth to tail. So we have a space-borne asset, and it's got embedded technologies in it, and then you've got kind of the, the ground asset, whether it be a ground station or ground infrastructure, that needs to be secured as well. And then that's tied into some type of, of critical infrastructure as defined by the 16 sectors that we have uh, out in the world today that's largely private industry driven. As I said earlier, if you heard uh, when I was on the panel, I talked about the 16 critical infrastructures and at all the NASA centers, we have pretty much all of those elements at a NASA center. So we have large SCADA systems uh, that run our, our, super, our, um, our wind tunnel environments. Uh, we have these large power stations, these substations that help uh, uh, power up our uh, ArcJet facility. And ArcJet is basically one of the things we do at Ames is thermal protection systems for, for spacecrafts. So uh, an ArcJet is basically kind of like a wind tunnel, shoot a, uh, some air down it, uh, you know, hypersonic and, and beyond, and basically shoot a lightning bolt down the middle to test different materials and that sort of thing, see how they withstand um, uh, the atmospheric, uh, the heat and that sort of thing. So there's, there's all this kind of critical infrastructure that's, that's uh, pushing and supporting this technology. And I said, you know, well, what are we doing around the security around that as well? So we needed to secure it from one end of the process all the way up to that asset. And so that's where Griffin kind of started going. I started looking a little deeper into industrial, industrial controls, SCADA systems, what security aspects are out there, and what technologies were out there today, and better yet, what technologies were we going to need in the future? At the same time, I'm getting a lot of calls, a lot of converse, having a lot of conversation with uh, venture capitalists out there in Silicon Valley area, and, and some just vendors who come and said, we have this technology, we'd like you to come and look at it, it's, uh, it's a security technology, it does X, Y, Z, tell us what you think. So I, you know, jump in my car, go out to uh, Palo Alto or one of the other uh, neighboring cities and uh, sit in a conference room and they run a demo uh, or a sandbox environment of this particular technology. And I'm like, this is, this is pretty cool technology. This has worked really, really well. But, you know, I think you, you might need to take a look at this or look at this. Or what about if I'm going to do this in the future, how would you protect against that? How would I build this in? And so I started to think a little bit more about, okay, so now I have an opportunity to bring in or look at next generation technology that's 18 months to three years out. But I needed an environment to be able to look at that technology, test it, bump up against it, and I needed an environment to do that. So I, that's when the Griffin really started to come together as a whole, as a, as a kind of a program that I was proposing out to, out to NASA. And when it really came down to it, it's me and uh, my CTO for IT, a gentleman named John Stiebel that's been working on it. And uh, we also brought in uh, the new um, uh, NASA Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity, Rob Powell, who's sitting on the table over here. Put your hand up, Rob. But, uh, so Rob, Rob's got a long background, deep background in, in building out the Department of Defense Information Assurance Cyber Range. So we started having these conversations about an environment where we can have, uh, we can uh, mimic or simulate an operational environment and run all kinds of, of, of tests in this environment against infrastructure, against proposed infrastructure, against technology, so on and so forth. So we looked at four different primary areas for, for, for Griffin X. The first area was applied research and development, testing and evaluation. There just, I felt that there just wasn't enough R&D, T&E going on uh, around the nation today. And if there is, a place to do R&D, you just can't get access to it. It's really, really hard. So DOD has environments um, where they do this kind of work, Department of Energy, so on and so forth, but getting access is, is really tough to do. So I said, you know, we need an area where we can do R&D and T&E &E and some, some verification and validation uh, work. Um, then we needed this platform to test everything. I said, we need a, a, a SIM environment, an operational 
uh, environment that mimics a real environment to be able to take technologies and put them in there or uh, take this environment and test it against uh, another simulated environment to see how technologies work, to see how um, defenses work, so on and so forth. And then I, the third piece was the training piece. I felt that our cyber defenders that we had today at NASA, that we needed more deeper training. So building upon what we knew at the top level, what R&D work that we could do, and it wouldn't be us doing the R&D work, it would be with communities of practice, and I'll get a little bit more into that. But what we learned from R&D, and then what we learned from using this testing platform, we could better train our cyber defenders about the latest uh, attacks that are out there, how technology works, what technology uh, works really well, uh, modifications to technology, and really bring our cyber defenders, our cyber core, up to speed. Then you take those three areas, and I felt that what we needed to do was then put that back out from an, from an information sharing perspective. What we learned about technology, what we learned about research, what we learned in the testing environment, and put that back out to the community. Because that's part of NASA's charter. A big part of NASA's charter is technology transfer and knowledge transfer, if you didn't know that. Um, we put out hundreds and hundreds of patents every year. We license those all around the world, and they're used for different applications. So a big area that I wanted to focus on and stay within was the information sharing aspect of what we learned about cyber defenses, critical infrastructure, defending against, uh, defending against attacks and critical infrastructure, and what we learned and um, what we trained people on. The idea was, overall, was that we wouldn't do it at NASA ourselves because we know that, um, as I said earlier, we don't have a monopoly on intellect. We do have a lot of smart people, a lot of really brilliant people at NASA, but we don't have the, the, intel, the uh, monopoly on intellect that's out there um, that can help us with uh, defining um, solutions uh, dealing with these cyber issues. So the idea was we'll start with NASA. We want to better protect our own resources uh, and our infrastructure and our emerging infrastructure all the way up to spacecrafts and aerial vehicles. At the same time, we wanted to, to bring in people from and individuals and groups from communities of practice. So that meant tapping into academia. It meant tapping into private industry. It meant tapping into other government agencies and DOD and giving them all access to these platforms and these technologies and let them work on those real times. And we share that information and what they learn back and forth. And again, use it for our own purposes internal to NASA. I think sometimes when people hear about Griffin and what we're doing, folks say like, well, why is NASA getting into the cyber business? You know, why are they building this environment or potentially uh, looking at building this environment? It wasn't about building an environment for the nation. It was about building an environment to better protect NASA's asset. And again, those emerging, emerging assets that where we believe that um, we're going to really need some forethought and foresight into what we're going to need to get to uh, Mars and how we're going to protect those systems. It was all about NASA. But then we learned that as we started bringing in communities of practice, it was something that we could turn into kind of a national asset that other uh, groups and individuals could use. When you're out in the Silicon Valley area, you see a lot of the innovators that are out there. Some of them are one and, and two man shops, right? Out just sitting in their garage coming up with some really, really inventive things, but they have no access to uh, R&D labs. You have the Federal Laboratory Consortiums, um, but they're, again, from someone who, who tried to use it when I was 19, 20 years old doing some work, very hard to get into, very hard to get time in those labs. So we also thought that this would be a good opportunity to bring in those folks, let them work on the, their innovation, but also use that innovation uh, for our needs and our purposes as well. So right now, uh, again, uh, Griffin X, uh, it's a proposal that's on the table. Uh, NASA is reviewing it uh, uh, at the, you know, the highest levels of, of NASA up through the administrator's office. Like anything else, it has to go through a process. Um, are we you know, using taxpayers' money um, in the right way? Uh, is this something that we should be doing? Is it the right thing to do? All these things have to be evaluated. You have to build business cases. People have to review it. And then you have to kind of validate uh, what you're doing with external sources. So we've been doing that. We've been having some validations. We're going getting to a point now where we're going to start talking to our stakeholder community. 
uh, and start gathering requirements. So this is our folks like on our mission programs or human space flight, start gathering requirements to understand what they need to better secure, whether it's that space asset or aerial asset and that ground infrastructure as well. So it's been about a, a year or so uh, in the making, uh, doing a lot of writing, a lot of, lot of visiting, a lot of talking to folks. I've been out in industry, I've done presentations at the Pentagon, a lot of energy behind it going really, really well. But uh, we think uh, in the next uh, several months, we're gonna have a stakeholder community, uh, stakeholder um, communities of practice uh, kind of a workshop. And then we're gonna have other communities of practice, you know, vendor meetings, that sort of thing to bring in and kind of help us scope this thing uh, a little bit more and get it down to uh, what we think uh, will be a viable uh, opportunity for not just for NASA, but for the community at large. So we're looking uh, forward to uh, working with folks, you know, all across the United States, internationally as well, and, and all of you here that have uh, solutions that you think uh, would help us uh, moving forward. So that's in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it. That's, that's Griffin uh, in a nutshell, what it is. Again, it doesn't exist, but it does uh, also, one thing I wanted to mention is that it's a physical environment, it has virtual aspects, and it does, uh, it does propose a classified environment as well and a non-class environment um, that the, we felt that the, the folks in the DOD and the Intel community would be interested in. And so far, the feedback we got is that they're highly interested in that. So I won't go more than that. That's about all the time I have, and I don't think we're going to do any questions or anything, right, Parham? So thanks, folks. <laughs>